This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is unfunded. Please help us to keep it going by subscribing or donating at www.philosophybites.com or you can become a patron at Patreon. You'd imagine that people who believe the self to be constantly changing might worry less about their own death than other people do. After all, they believe they probably won't have much in common with the self that eventually dies. Sean Nichols, a philosopher and moral psychologist, has conducted empirical research on death anxiety and the view of the self. He's come up with some surprising findings. Sean Nichols, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. The topic we're going to talk about today is death and the self. Most people know what death is. Tell us a bit about the philosophical background to questions about the self. Well, there is a long tradition of work in philosophy in different traditions that challenges the idea that there's some consistent self that stays the same across time. So the idea is that most people think that there's one self that they have from the beginning that they retain throughout their biological life. But in Buddhism and in David Hume and in Derek Parfit, this is challenged in various ways. So the most extreme version is the Buddhist view that claims that there's no self at all, that that's just an illusion. People like Parfit maintain that there might be a self, but it changes radically across time. In all of these traditions, the view is that once you come to appreciate that, it should have effects on the way you live your life and think about the future. So most famously of all, I guess, David Hume, when he tried to introspect to find his self, he couldn't find anything. It was just a series of impressions. That's right. And that theme shows up that we expect there to be something that's exactly the same across time, whether through introspection or just as a matter of fact. So views that there's a soul that stays the same is one way to try to substantiate that or hold on to that view. And that was just rejected by the Buddhists and by Hume and Parfit. Wittgenstein said that philosophy leaves everything as it is. But the claim here is that if you come to realize that the self is not an enduring thing, that you might actually change the way you navigate the world. Yeah, good, that's right. So this is supposed to have revolutionary implications. It's very clear in Buddhism, and it's also clear in Parfit, who starts out in Reasons and Persons. He says that he's a revisionary philosopher, not a descriptive philosopher. It's supposed to make a difference. If you came to realize that there is no such thing as the self, what difference would that make? Well, one difference it's supposed to make, and you find this in both Buddhism and in Parfit, is that it should make you more generous towards other people, at least in the future, because you think that, well, I'm not going to be that much the same in the future. So my self-interest for that individual in the future should be diminished as a result of it being not so much me, and I should be accordingly more generous with other people in the future. Because if one is less me, one is more part of the wider world. The gap between me and everybody else seems to diminish. Well, that's one possibility. I think a simpler possibility is that it's just that insofar as I don't care as much about that guy in the future because he's not as much me, the other things I care about might just weigh more. So, of course, I care about other people. Even right now, I care about other people. And I care about other people in the future. But if I think that myself in the future isn't as much the same, then the relative amount that I care might really be different than if I think I'm exactly the same in the future. Generosity towards others, that's one aspect of how one might change. Are there any others? Another prominent example is attitudes about responsibility. So if I think that I'm not as much the same person now as I was last year, then I should think that the things I did last year, I currently am less responsible for because that's less me in the past. So we've got generosity, we've got responsibility about past sins, and I guess taking credit for the good acts we've performed in the past. Generosity, responsibility, is that it? Well, the other one, the most prominent one, is death, attitudes about death. So you find in Buddhism, the claim is that you shouldn't fear death because the idea that death is a bad thing is somehow grounded in this misconception that there is an enduring self. And you find this view in Parfit as well. Parfit's view is less extreme than Buddhism, since, as I, as I mentioned, he doesn't deny the existence of the self. But what he says is that insofar as I will be very different in 20 years, this organism, the psychological characteristics that it has in 20 years will be so different than the ones it has now. I shouldn't be all that worried about the death of that person in the future because it's not as much me. Parfit and the Buddhist tradition both claim that 
we should come to change the way we behave if we come to recognise this new view of the self. Now you're on the cusp of philosophy and psychology and you've actually tested whether coming to this new view does affect one's behaviour. Perhaps we can begin by describing what the experiment consisted in. Okay, so the basic design of these experiments was inspired by Parfit's work, and the initial experiments were done by Dan Bartels at University of Chicago. You get one group of subjects, and you tell them that there's social science research that suggests that the self is constantly changing. We know that that leads people to think that the self changes. Another group is told that social science research supports the idea that the self is very stable and stays the same across time. And we know that that does lead subjects to think that the self is stable. Now, we're actually not lying to the subjects in these experiments because the state of social science is so primitive at this point that there's evidence on both sides. And so it's easy to say both of those things. It's just we don't tell the subjects all of the story. And what was the result? So we've done several studies. I'll start with the one on generosity. So in this study, we manipulated this so half of the subjects were led to think the self changes and half were led to think that the self stays the same. And then we had them make a decision about giving money to a charity in the future. They would split the money between themselves and the charity and this division would, would be enacted a year in the future. What we found was that people who thought the self changed a lot were more generous with that money in the future than people who thought the self stayed the same. That's a perfect result. That's exactly the kind of result Parfit would have liked you to reach. Yeah, exactly. And then we followed it up by trying to see whether we could get the same kind of effect just by measuring people's attitudes. So we had people make this decision, how much money do you want to go to the charity, how much do you want to go to you, set out a year from now. And then after they made that decision, we just measured the extent to which they thought their self stayed the same. And again, we found people who independently thought the self changed a lot were more generous with the charity in the future. Have you tested responsibility as well, whether people feel they're less responsible for past actions if they can be persuaded that the self is a more fragile aspect of their being than they previously believed. Yeah. Hannah Tierney, a grad student of mine at Arizona, and a few other people and I did exactly that. We asked people about a past transgression, and again, we manipulated whether the self stayed the same or whether the self changed. And then we asked the extent to which they thought they should be punished for a transgression a year ago. And we found that people who, who were led to believe the self changes a lot were significantly less punitive. They thought they deserved less punishment than people who thought the self stayed the same. Once again, bingo. The weakening of the idea of the self leads to a weaker connection between your past actions and whether you think you should be punished for them. Right. Yeah, we were delighted. Both of those results, the result on generosity and punishment, were very encouraging. And now the big one. What about attitudes to death? If you could be persuaded that the self was weaker than you had previously believed, do you come to view death as something to be less feared? We tried this in many ways, manipulating views about the self and checking about the extent to which it affected death anxiety. So the death anxiety question, we've used a few, but here's one. You say, if you imagine dying in a year, to what extent are you anxious about never thinking or experiencing anything again? And what we found was that manipulating beliefs about the self has absolutely no effect on death anxiety. We tried this so many ways, thinking that tweaking the instructions might make a difference. Every single time it was flat. There was no effect at all on that. One way of testing this, I guess, would be to compare Buddhists with non-Buddhists, to ask, I don't know, Tibetan monks whether they feared death less than those in the Christian or the Hindu or the Muslim tradition. Right, yeah, and that is what we've been doing over the last year or so. We have been doing research on Tibetan monks in monasteries in southern India and Hindus in the Varanasi area and then Christians and Muslims in the U.S., primarily Christians. And the idea was that, well, maybe the problem with these manipulations that we've been doing in the West is that it's just too weak to get an effect. You actually need to have it an important part of the culture the way it is in the Buddhist tradition. We measured many things. So just to set the background, 
we found that when you ask the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Christians about the extent to which there is a self that stays the same, the Hindus and Christians maintain that there is a self that stays the same. The Buddhist monks dramatically deny it. They say there is no self that stays the same. They're very consistent about that. They deny that there's this, to any significant extent the same person in a year that they are now. They think that things are much less permanent than other subjects. We had implicit measures. So in every measure we used, the monastery Tibetans were embracing the idea of no self. It was really robust. And did you find that Tibetan monks faced their demise with much greater equanimity than the Hindus? Uh, to our astonishment, no. Moreover, they showed much greater fear of death than the Hindus or the Christians. It's a huge effect. Our interest was in this idea of the self, and so we used something called the self-annihilation factor, which really is about, like, to what extent are you afraid of death because the self dies? To what extent are you afraid of the death because the personality is gone? And what we found was that the Tibetan monks were just much more afraid. They reported much greater fear than the Hindus or the Christians. Do you have any kind of explanation for why there's no correlation at all between attitudes towards the self and fear of death? I think it's a big puzzle right now. There are a couple of different factors here that are interesting. One is just why doesn't it work? So that's one question. And then one, and then another question is, why are the Tibetans more fearful? So I want to start with the question, why doesn't it work? Why does it seem like the no self belief doesn't have the effect that you would expect it to, which is to make them fear death less? I think the most plausible explanation is that when you're thinking about death, you're actually not thinking about your traits at all. You're projecting yourself into the future in a kind of episodic way. You're just imagining, I am in the future and I'm going to die. Same way when you think about the past, if you think about something from your distant past, like, say, your first kiss. You know, when I think about my first kiss, I know cognitively that I am a very different set of traits than that individual. But that doesn't interfere at all with the sense that I am the person who had that first kiss. And so when I think about the past, in this episodic way, my experiences, my traits really are not implicated in those recollections. They don't diminish those recollections. Similarly, when I think about the future, I'm just thinking about myself in the future. I'm not thinking about the traits in the future. I'm just thinking about myself in the future. And myself in the future and imminent death seems really bad, even if I think the traits change. And why would Tibetan monks who hold this no self-belief be additionally fearful of death? There I have a much more speculative proposal. One of the features of the tradition is that you're supposed to think about death a lot in that tradition. You're supposed to think about death every day. And it might be that that actually makes you a little more fearful of death, that that constant reminder of it. It might be that a better way to cope with the idea of death is to think about something else. But that's just a guess. Can we come back to the question we started at the beginning? that there are some philosophers who are revisionists in the sense that they believe that philosophy can make a difference. You're presenting a kind of mixed picture here. So in some areas it looks like a change in philosophical belief does do that. In other areas it seems to have no effect at all. Right. We started this project thinking that we wanted to see whether philosophy could make a difference. And it looks like it does in some of these cases, the generosity case and the punishment case, and in other cases as well that other people have done research on. That's an interesting fact and I think a heartening fact. The failure of getting it to make a difference on death, I think, shows a practical failing, of course, but it might reveal something philosophically interesting about the way we think about ourselves. So when you think again about the Tibetan monks who are afraid of death, the no self view is not really impacting that. It might be that this sort of idea of projecting yourself into the future or thinking about something in the past, that that is just too deeply ingrained in human psychology to be moved around by these cognitive beliefs we have about the nature of the self. It just runs too deep in our psyche to manipulate in the right way. Sean Nichols, thank you very much. Thanks, this is a delight. For more Philosophy Bites, go to www.philosophybites.com. You can also find details there of Philosophy Bites books and how to support us.